we're, we're, we're very happy to have some of the biggest players here in the room and uh, also like one of the best journalists on the apps industry with Kemai Cutler and uh, to, to nail them and discuss really like what all these tools are about and what kind of value they bring. Kim, I'll let sure. you. Um, so I run Inside Mobile Apps. It's part of the Inside Network, and we I, I mostly focus on uh, Android and iOS apps that have really defined revenue models and all the services providers that do things for them, like handle distribution, monetization, and other tool sets. Um, but today we're going to talk about tools. Um, so there's a couple different trends that have been you know really interesting in the last uh, last couple years. So one on one side. The app ecosystem has really um, matured and it's very, very competitive now. And so a lot of entrepreneurs I run into don't necessarily want to have um, you know, just one-off apps where you know, they run the risk of dealing with changing consumer taste or being in a hits-driven industry. So they look for pain points in the process of building or marketing or distributing or monetizing apps um, and try to find like reproducible sets of tools that they can thereby sell to the developers. And at the same time, on the opposite end, there is this amazing, ridiculous war for developer talent in the Valley. And even as a reporter, I get constant inquiries from, from different uh, you know, mobile developers asking, like, do you know someone who's really good on Android or on iOS? And I've been offered crazy things like, if you find someone and they stay for three months, we'll give you a trip to Hawaii or whatever. I don't take it because I'm a reporter. But, um, so what that means is it's often you know, cheaper for a developer to do something like pay Urban Airship for um, you know, a fraction of a penny every time they send uh, an app and notifications instead of paying $150,000 for a developer to uh, create an in-house system um, instead of doing something more valuable. So um, I just wanted to go down the line and maybe each of you could talk a little bit about what, are, what the, tools you are, the tools that you offer to developers. Sure. Uh, so I'm Scott Kaviton. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Urban Airship. Uh, we are a pickaxe and shovel business. We saw all these people rushing to mobile, and we knew that app developers were going to need tools to help with things like push notifications, in-app purchase subscriptions. Uh, messaging is really at the core of what we do, notifications. So uh, score, scores for uh, uh, ESPN, breaking news for New York Times, the daily deal for Living Social and Groupon. Uh, we've sent about 13 billion notifications to about 350 million devices. We've got about 40,000 customers. Um, so it's been a really, really interesting uh, business for us. This, this is a fantastic show. I, I just love this show. It's, it's, it's too good. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. Um, my name is Brian Mullen. Um, head up BD at a San Francisco-based company called Twilio. And uh, we're a cloud communication company. Um, and, and basically what we do is uh, develop, uh, deliver tools, APIs, to developers to build voice and SMS and, and other aspects of communication um, into their applications. So, um, you know, rather than kind of uh, uh, forcing them to conform to, you know, uh, kind of more, more uh, or lesser known standards, we um, make them accessible in, you know, Java or .NET or Python or what have you, and really try to focus on being a, a developer-friendly um, company so that people can really concentrate on the, on the things that they do best, which is, which is build their own applications rather than having to kind of conform to, uh, oops. <laughs> Ouch. Um, so we've got a, a community of about um, 80,000 developers, and so, um, we could probably help out, and I'd love to have a trip to Hawaii, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi. My name is Michael Wagnin. I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called AppSolar. Basically, what we do is we help these developers measure and increase both engagement and lifetime value of their customers within their mobile apps. Uh, so you see, the, what we see is that mobile offers a, an unprecedented opportunity in terms of customer engagement. Unfortunately, and we'll talk about it hopefully today, that engagement can be very short-lived and very fickle. Um, so what we think is key to actually measure uh, that, uh, that engagement and increase it is to actually have a series of tools first around and analytics that are really uh, geared towards measuring that engagement in a very quantified way, correlate that engagement with revenue, and then use that all, all that engagement data from the analytics to start personalizing the experience so that you end up increasing the user, um, uh, the user loyalty and have them spend more money within your apps. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> My name is Miko, and I'm with Key Corporation. The reason why you 
probably never heard of us is we just launched today. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so, um, in any case, you know, despite the fact that I begged, begged, begged Candace to get onto this panel, uh, we are not a tools company. <laughs> I'll say more about this in a minute. We actually have developer tools. Uh, we're a platform company. We do have a venture arm. Uh, Nuno introduced himself already uh, in the last panel with a question. Key Capital. Uh, so we have a venture capital arm. We also have a technology arm, which provides developer tools. And then we have a distribution arm, which handles uh, deals with primarily Asian handset manufacturers and carriers. So that, that's pretty much key, KII.com, and you can look us up and you'll learn more. So um, one of the things that I run into a lot as a journalist is I get um, one-off app developers that come to me and say they suddenly have this SDK or they have a set of APIs that are really awesome, that are the best things since sliced bread, and please, please, please develop, you know, get the news out there. I hope that lots of developers will sign up. But I'm wondering, um, you know, what is the essential difference between uh, you know, tools providers that are actually able to take off and have a sustainable business model where they can charge um, developers and, and, and build something lasting versus the ones that aren't. And so I, I was wondering maybe if Scott and Brian could talk about this, maybe Scott first. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, actually, why don't you start? Don't <laughs> um, so, so the question is uh, kind of how, how to kind of build up, build up a developer community? Is that yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I'm really, if you got to 80,000 developers, I'm really curious, like what were, what were the intermediate steps or strategic steps that you had to take to make it, you know? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we actually have a kind of small army of our uh, developer evangelists here. Um, we, we just really have it um, as kind of a, an important part of, of who we are as a company. Um, you know, we, we, we ourselves, our, our co-founders are developers themselves. Um, they started the company. And, and if you really think about, like, why we exist as a company, it's to, it was to solve a problem. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily to, um, you know, start your own thing or, 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 or uh, make a bunch of money. It was to solve a problem that, uh, that our co-founders, as developers themselves, had run into a couple of times. So, so our, our um, CEO, Jeff Lawson, was uh, one of the first, he was the first CTO at a, an American company called StubHub. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of StubHub, but it's now, it's now part of uh, eBay. And essentially, it's a, it's, it was one of the first online ticket exchanges. So, you know, if you're a season ticket holder, you had a game on Saturday, um, you wanted to sell it online because you couldn't make it, StubHub would handle that process for you, find someone to buy it, and then they would actually get, and this is before electronic or, or certainly before mobile tickets, so you actually physically had to get a pair of tickets across town from you know, the seller to the buyer. And so um, when they were kind of building the system, they're thinking, God, you know, they'd have to end the, end the sale on uh, a Thursday for a Saturday game, kind of deal with getting the ticket across town on Friday. They're thinking, God, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool to have um, you know, to, to have a, a kind of workflow um, to, with communication to actually be able to dispatch a courier and kind of dynamically within, within an admin workflow uh, handle the, the, the process of getting the ticket across town. So um, they're like, you know, terrific, that would be great. This is, you know, we can kind of dispatch, by, dispatch a courier either by text or voice and kind of coordinate with uh, uh, getting the tickets from the, from the buyer to, or from the seller to the buyer. And, um, you know, it'll all be kind of centrally uh, monitored and, and run from this uh, admin tool. And, Everything will be terrific. And they're like, well, we don't know the first thing about telecom or how to do this at all. We may as well have been asking us to, to build a bridge. Like, no clue how to do this. Um, and so they just frankly weren't able to do it. And, and that was actually kind of the, the idea behind Twilio, you know, years later. It's like, here's this problem that exists. Like, how can we actually incorporate communication in, into what we're trying to do, into the, into the problems we're trying to solve? And so um, we think about that every single day. And every single product that we have, um, you know, throughout the whole platform, and everything we talk about is about solving pr um, problems that developers face every day. And so I think when you kind of walk that um, and, and talk that as a company, um, you know, people pick up on that, and, and it, it really kind of you know fosters a good a good relationship with your developer community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, th I think the first thing that we did was we scratched a niche, which was you know we saw a problem with sending notifications, and we found that it was a little bit difficult. Um, then we actually engaged customers, and this is so stinking cliche, but um, you actually have to talk to your customers and find out what they will pay for. It sounds really silly, but you know, we, we actually um, we ended up acquiring a company called Simple Geo to add a bunch of geolocation technology to what we're doing with messaging. Our customers wanted that. 
Simple Geo had built this unbelievable stack of technology, but they hadn't been able to monetize it because they hadn't actually you know, really engaged their customers to say, hey, what part of this would you pay for? And what we found is you know, hooking the two together is what's sort of the magic. Being able to deliver a message to the right user at the right time in the right place is super, super powerful. But you know, again, it's that customer discovery piece, going out and actually talking to your top customers and then advocating them, talking about them and their successes and, uh, and making, them, you know, making them win. So. Mm -hmm. So now let's address like how some of the individual tools that you're offering are changing with the, the marketplace. So I'm wondering, uh, from Michael, you were one of I think you were the first analytics provider to come out with cohort analytics, is that, which is really actually pretty important for game developers. Because if you change your app from week to week, you want to be able to figure out, you know, whether that change resulted in better retention and, and monetization. So I was wondering if you talk about um, how you've seen analytics become more sophisticated over the last year. Yeah, um, just first to react on your former question, if, if I can. Yeah. Um, it all starts, I agree with these two gentlemen, with, uh, with the fact that you need to address a pain point in the marketplace. Yeah. If you don't, you have no business. The other key consideration with developers is um, if you ask them for money up front, uh -huh. don't waste your time. I mean, if you want to do developer relations, you first have to have something free and extremely valuable, meaning that it addresses the pain. And then, as Scott said, you need to find where the extra mile uh, is in order to make them pay for something. Um, in terms of cohort analysis, I don't know how much, how many people here have heard about cohort analysis by show of hands? Wow. Yeah. It's really a geeky Definitely. audience. It's cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, cohort analysis is extremely important for um, uh, mobile app developers, as I said, and to um, uh, to build on the on the point on the point of the the pain that we are addressing in the in the market. Really, when it comes to native apps, what we've seen, especially in gaming, Kime, is that customer engagement is really a problem. We actually have uh, coined a uh, uh, within uh, within Appslar the um, the phrase of the fourth day syndrome. Basically, what we've seen is that, um, especially in the mobile gaming vertical, if after a user has downloaded your game, um, if four day after four four day after they have downloaded your game, they don't show up again in the game, the likelihood that they will ever show up is actually less than seven percent. Now that's a staggering number. So if you don't work on that engagement problem. And if you don't work on that engagement problem within the first four days, which is not a lot of time, you actually are not going to have a very successful app. I introduced to you cohort analysis, basically. What you want to do is you want to, on a daily basis, based on, you want to basically segment your users based on the day when they have first used your app, and then keep an eye on them in a separate segment, hence the name cohort, and look at them in real time every day after they have uh, 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 downloaded and started to use your app. Now the question is, um, what kind of indicator should I follow every day? Well, the first that come to mind, obviously, to every uh, um, uh, game developers that we started to work with a few months ago mm -hmm. is retention, opening the app. How many people come back and reopen my app? And this is the first key indicator that you should that you should address. But then, and this is where it evolved, then this game developer said, this is great, we were able to tweak things and relaunch a new version, and therefore, with the new version launch, it's a new cohort and we can compare that open rate on a daily basis. But now we need to move to the next stage, and we need new key indicators, and the new set of key indicators are basically engagement indicators, any kind of action or behavior within the app that is a good proxy of engagement. In a game, it's leveling up. In a, uh, in a uh, news app, it's consuming, it's consuming content. It's really different, but all of them needed to actually follow that. And now we're at the point, and we just launched that recently, where the key indicator has to be revenue-oriented. Mm -hmm. how, how much revenue I'm generating out of this cohort on a daily basis based on the, this version of the app. Revenue, ARPU, average revenue per paid user as well, all these key indicators are now requested by these app developers. And finally, because 
all, what we are saying here is that they are discovering, these developers are discovering that there is a life after the download. Um, last year, it was all about the download, right? Now there is a life after the download. I'm getting a download. I need to make sure that they're engaged, that they come back, and that they spend money with me. Um, the last big push around cohort analysis is having the ability to also segment your cohort by acquisition channel. Because what you want to do, after all, is mix these two when, which is the version of the app after you have tweaked, and from where you're getting these users and find the best users from this kind of source that come back and are highly engaged and monetizing. I think, Miko, want, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I wanted to respond a little bit to uh, your kind of original question. I actually really uh, liked where you ended up going with your comments, Michael, uh, about it's all about the kind of revenue aspect. Because I think one of the things that Kim May said is, how, how do you create a sustainable business with tools? And I think, really, she's way too polite. Because I think, you know, from my side, the way I look at it is, is that, you know, the tools, the subtext is, is that tools, selling tools is a, uh, dare I say, a shitty business, right? Uh, you know, in some ways, the time during which selling tools is really attractive is during the gold rush, right? And there's a few companies that are able to kind of convert that into really sustainable, which is the word that you used. So I really want to emphasize that word. Uh, you know, I, I really want to kind of badly misquote uh, Steve Yegi, who was the guy at Google who did his platform rant. And his rant basically said, an app without a platform will be replaced by an app with a platform. And I think uh, I could badly misquote him by saying that tools without a platform will be replaced by tools with the platform. So, uh, you know, I, I think that really that's kind of the frame that I think is important to consider, particularly as we see the App Store uh, maturing and evolving. And you're seeing the concerns of developers changing pretty radically. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can just yeah, react, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just with a personal opinion, um, everything is, is a tool from a software standpoint. What makes a tool a tool is a business model. I, I, maybe I'm wrong here, but if you're selling that tool, then it becomes a tool business. Is that what you mean by asking you know, Sorry, the tool? We're talking about tools and platform here, yeah. and I'm getting a little bit confused, so uh, I just want to put something. Let me, let me clarify, let me clarify. <laughs> I, uh, sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Uh, Do you mind clarifying after I finish the oh, question? Oh, I'm sorry. I That's okay. Realize. So, are you, are you, are you much, do you understand platform as tools that are sold not on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, but are used as within an ecosystem and creating a value for the whole ecosystem? Is that it? Yeah, so I'll just say that platform is an invariant substrate atop which you launch your business. And so from that vantage point, contracts are tools. And whether those contracts are business contracts or whether they're API technical contracts, those are the substrates atop which enterprises are launched, right? So from that vantage point, you could call all of those technical contracts tools. So I, I okay. think we're okay. Um, so, Riga, the next question is for you. I mean, I, um, the launch that you have today is really a culmination of a long process that, in many ways, I think is a little bit emblematic of the, the change from, you know, a carrier, a more carrier-controlled era um, in app distribution to one that is, you know, predominantly reliant on now the iOS and Android stores. And I was wondering if you could explain that, uh, that transition a little bit. Yeah. So uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, question because, you know, Key Corporation actually has a originally a carrier origin, so we, we have a very successful business doing synchronization work in Japan and in Asia, which is how we developed all of these relationships with carriers. You know, we, we announced, uh, you know, eight partners this morning, um, all the carriers in Japan, uh, you know, some handset makers, HTC, you know, so we've got a lot of relationships that come from that history. But the thing that's kind of amazing about this transformation that's happening now is that everything is inverted. So it's being driven out of the app store. So you know, ultimately, preloading isn't going to be push-based. It's going to be pull-based. And I think from our vantage point, you know, this whole driving of the ecosystem, and you know, I think as Michael pointed out, these 
creation of new value chains through what people call tools. Uh, I think is really what's happening out there, and you know the most exciting part of it all. Okay, um, so I wanted to ask, actually, come back to Brandon Scott. Um, how do you deal with the kind of like sandwich problem that Miko was alluding to, where um, you know it's very it's it's relatively easy for you to reach out to small developers because for them it's so it's so resource intensive to reproduce what you do, and yet um, you know with larger companies they're going to move off and you know do their build their own stuff in house. And so, for I mean, for example, with Twilio, um, you know, although your your platform, although you're way more diversified now. I mean, in the beginning, like a year ago, I, from my understanding, like a huge part of uh, your revenue was in like, group messaging apps, right? And so, GroupMe and then Beluga were subsequently acquired by like Facebook and Skype, and that put you in a position where you had to figure out what was going on. And I know you're not going to talk about your contracts, but <laughs> it's just an example of a situation. Right. I was wondering how you deal with it. Um, so, so we actually uh, started out doing voice only. Yeah. Um, so we, we only did voice for uh, the first year or so, added messaging later. Um, and so what happened was, uh, uh, thanks to TechCrunch, there was kind of a, a wave of popularity around kind of group messaging. But, uh, you know, primarily we, we've, we've kind of, you know, had a, had a pretty good mix of both, both voice and messaging. And so, um, you know, to, to your point about uh, uh, kind of uh, new opportunities, um, you know, we, we've, you know, the way we see this is, um, yes, we have a, a very simple, a simple product that uh, is easy for, you know, two guys in a garage to, uh, that are building Beluga or, or GroupMe um, to uh, kind of build an application and, and eventually start a, start a company. Very simple to get up and running. I mean, there's a pretty well-known story about the guys who started GroupMe showing up to Hackathon, uh, building a, an SMS group messaging product um, using the Twilio API, um, getting a bunch of people on it, and then, you know, uh, getting VC funding and selling out to Skype within you know 11 months for you know 80 some million or whatever it was so pretty pretty awesome success story um, and that's what uh, you know a lot of the the kind of um, public focus has been on but but if you really look at our at, at our growth and our, our revenue as a company we are, we are aimed at the enterprise and aimed at the mm -hmm. aimed at the SMB so um, you know we we have those two guys in our garage that are kind of small companies doing small things and then some of those like group me get to be you know small companies doing big things but then we also have um, you know big logos that you know Salesforce into it is using us for two-factor authentication um, uh, eBay we mentioned through the StubHub example um, LinkedIn um, you know Salesforce the, 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 the list goes on and on so so we really see that as an area of growth and um, it is it is uh, net it, it is net new traffic that is um, you know we're making it accessible to groups of people developing products and, and services in those big organizations um, that otherwise you know uh, weren't necessarily going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, we started with uh, the individual app developers, and we have a lot of, of indie devs uh, on our platform. But now we're finding that the big brands and enterprises are looking at mobile and trying to figure out how to do this, and they actually can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ESPN's a great example. Um, they want to be able to light up a stadium in a second with notifications, right? That's a non-trivial thing for them to be able to do you know, in-house. You can't just hire an engineer at $150,000 and you sort of cross your fingers. Um, so, so we actually see a, a, a pretty huge trend in terms of outsourcing this kind of infrastructure. I think the other piece here is, is you know, the internet was kind of neat, but mobile is at such a huge scale uh, that you can't just try and do these things in-house. And I think we're going to see a huge outsourcing uh, over the next you know, five to 10 years. Mm, cool. So we're almost out of time. Is, does anybody have a question that they want to ask? Hello. Hey. Good morning. Yes, the question I'm trying to link with the previous panel and this one. Um, I love the web developer community, of course, and the thing is uh, these tools that people generate, sometimes careers have their in-house tools for developers also. And I, I connect what I think you said regarding the, uh, the most, I know, was the company? Waze, uh, sorry. Waze uh, regarding uh, careers making it easy for their developers to use tools that they feel comfortable with. Uh, and I understand careers want to also move into the space of of developers also. Um, so I just wanted to l launch a question to the panel as to how, how do they see uh, working with careers, the tools that they provide, how, how do they, they see they can fit in with the careers' own object objectives of uh, developing their own tools for, for, for their own web developers? Thank you. 
My response is simple. Okay, can you, you try to, oh, you can go ahead. My response is simple. I, uh, right now I see no incentive for a young startup like us to actually go and work with the carriers. Um, I see no um, financial economic benefit at this point. Um, it, they cannot give us distribution and uh, they give us a long sales cycle. I, that's, not, that's not an enticing proposition. So, so for Twilio, um, our, our answer is, uh, you know, we, we actually uh, have, a, have a kind of good relationship with, with carriers, frankly get asked a question a lot, and, um, you know, part of that is the, the fundamental thing that we do. What, what, what do we do? We, uh, you know, using our API, you can, you know, make and receive phone calls from within an application. You can send or receive a message. You can kind of provision uh, a phone number, uh, whether it's one number or 50,000 numbers, all kind of dynamically from within an application. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not, we're not operating a, a big uh, voice or data network ourselves. What, what are we really trying to do? We're, we're trying to make those networks that, that carriers, um, you know, big global carriers like, like Telefonica, like Vodafone, like, like Verizon are, uh, are, are good at. We want to take, take what they've, what they've done um, and kind of open it up to the, the greater web developer community. And so, um, you know, in years past, uh, you know, it's, if you want to do anything in, in voice, you had to become an expert in SIF. If you wanted to do anything in, in messaging, you had to be an, an expert in, in SMPP. And, oh, by the way, you know, um, uh, you know, look at the size of the enterprise or wholesale teams of, of carriers. That they're just not armed to deal with every single, you know, two guys in a garage or even um, smaller, you know, medium-sized businesses. It's just, it's just not, not the best way to manage their time. And so what we try to do is... Um, we, we kind of mask a lot of that complexity and, and remove those barriers so that the next group near Beluga or you know the next kind of new interesting product within a big enterprise can can be developed relatively quickly using um, you know in, in technology and languages that people are already already working in. So if you're in Ruby, you, you care about Ruby. You you don't want to spend a bunch of time getting smart on SIP and then you know meeting some minimum threshold of volume. So so we are see ourselves as as being an, an extension. Um, and, and really trying to um, open up what, what's kind of been, you know, inaccessible to the greater web developer community. I've got yeah, the next question too. here. Over here. Uh, hi there, my name is Nils Henning uh, from a company called Big Point Video Games uh, Company. I'm the CCO there. Two questions uh, to you, just very short. First of all, what's your business model, all of you? How do you earn money? And the second question, I liked it a lot, how, app notif or how push notifications rise uh, the retention on apps can you give me an example of what's before sending push and what's after sending push regarding the retention? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't give specific customer names because most people don't want to share it um, because it's so good. Um, but, you know, to give you an idea, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Like, you know, we're, we're talking about 70% open rates for apps, for users who are opted in. We actually just launched a, a new feature today uh, that allows you to see opt-in and opt-out reporting so that you can actually measure the messaging that you're sending. Uh, out to users because it's, it's a fine line, you know, with, with, with great power comes great responsibility. You can't just blast notifications at users. They will turn you off and that is the worst thing ever. Um, you know, uh, in terms of our business model, we charge, uh, you know, we have a freemium model because you have to give something out to the, the indie developers. Uh, and it's a great way to drive them into to more advanced features. Um, we have pro plans and, and then the enterprise is where we make most of our business, which is where we have an audience-based model. So we charge on a per active user per month. And an active user is somebody who has downloaded the app and has agreed to receive notifications. And then they get all they can eat messaging. Um, I, think that's, that's awesome. I think that's a fantastic model for us. Um, you know, to that last uh, question about the carriers, I, I think it's the carriers, we're excited about talking with the operators um, because we're in messaging and there is a huge opportunity and they're getting disintermediated. SMS is, is starting to, to, you know, we're seeing uh, chinks in the armor, as it were, and uh, there's a huge opportunity there, and, and you know, so we definitely want to do something with them. Are we? Do we oh. have any more questions? Do you have more questions here, or do people want to have lunch? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I don't have a question. Actually, I, I have a remark. So I think um, IBM killed um, tool business after they open sourced Eclipse some years ago. And uh, I don't see anybody make money with tools, but if you want to do it, there's one European company called JetBrains. They have a good business model, but that's the only one. And by the way, I'm a tech publisher. So there's still more opportunity. Kenneth, shall we go to the front and thank everybody and say goodbye and leave them off to their lunches <laughs> and chats? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.